Good morning and welcome to worship. It's a joy to be with you and sharing in this time together online. Looking forward to the day when we can meet together in person again. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Jessica. I'm one of the local preachers in the Richmond and Hounslow circuit. And since Jeffrey and Kathy and Adam have been enjoying being outside for their services, I thought I'd have a go at being outside in the beautiful sunshine today as well. I have to say I'm very disappointed because there doesn't appear to be any sign of Michael Ball where I am or any celebrities at all in fact so I don't think I'm going to best Jeffrey's guest appearance that he had uh, when he was on Barnes Common which is terribly disappointing. We hope that you find the worship today fruitful and brings you comfort and a challenge from the gospel in this time. We're going to start by singing um, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, which has been recorded for us by Tom and some of his friends. And then Immy and Isabel are going to lead us in our prayers. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we praise you for you are loving and kind. We rejoice for you are good. For those people in our lives who reflect your goodness and love, we thank you. We praise you for you care and provide. We rejoice because you are always there. For the key workers, NHS staff, teachers, train drivers, refugee collectors, and so many more. Those who are making sure that life still functions, we thank you. We praise you for you are our defender and our rock. We rejoice for you protect. For the people in our lives who have defended and supported us when we needed help. We thank you. We praise you for you are the giver of life and we rejoice that you give strength. For the times in our lives that we have felt there was no way out, but you provided us with the strength to carry on, we thank you. We lift you now in the stillness of our hearts the specific things that have happened that we want to thank you for since we last came to you. We lift up these things to you, Lord, the things that have been said and the things that remain unspoken. And we bring them together with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. As we come to our time of confession, we reflect on the events of the past week, our words, our thoughts and our actions. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you now, we are aware of our many failings, our inability to act on behalf of others, our thoughtless comments, our selfishness, or our desire for self-preservation, regardless of the needs of others. We are sorry for the missed opportunities to share your love with others, and for the mistakes we have made, either knowingly or without thinking. Most of all, we are sorry for the times when doubt has crept in and we have forgotten to trust you. Please forgive us. Open our lives again to your love. Hold us. Forgive us. Transform us. Amen. As we start a new week, may we begin afresh, renewed in God's grace, in the knowledge that we have been forgiven, and remember to forgive those who hurt us. We sing now together, Seek ye first the kingdom of God.
James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, from the Message version of the Bible. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half-starved and say, Good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can already hear one of you agreeing by saying, Sounds good. You take care of the faith department, I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith, fit together in hand and glove. Do I hear you professing to believe in the one and only God, but then observe you complacently sitting back as if you had done something wonderful? That's just great. Demons do that. But what good does it do them? Use your heads. Do you suppose for a minute that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? Wasn't our ancestor Abraham made right with God by works when he placed his son Isaac on the sacrificial altar? Isn't it obvious that faith and works are yoked partners, that faith expresses itself in works? that the works are works of faith. The full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. It's that mesh of believing and acting that got Abraham named God's friend. Is it not evidence that a person is made right with God, 
not by a barren faith, but by faith fruitful in works. The same with Rahab, the Jericho harlot. Wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape that seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God? The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up with a corpse. Separate faith and works and you get the same thing, a corpse. Amen. Luke chapter 11 verses 1 to 13 Jesus teaching on prayer One day Jesus was praying in a certain place When he had finished one of his disciples said to him Lord teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples He said to them When you pray say Father hallowed be your name your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. Alleluia. 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 You might notice I'm sitting somewhere a little different to where I <laughs> welcomed you all to the service today. Unfortunately, having filmed uh, my reflection outside as well, I then listened back to it and realised that I'd done it on a particularly blustery day. And whilst you could hear me, I was being slightly upstaged by the wind in Bushy Park. So I thought that I'd better sit somewhere a little bit more sensible and have another go. Uh, but I should just say a huge thank you to my sister Kate who came on a socially distanced walk with me to the park 
and held the camera so steady for the first recording, which was a good 12 minutes long, and I'm so sad not to use all of her good work, but I, unfortunately, I can't compete with the wind or with the military helicopters that flew over halfway through the recording. So I'm back here in my living room, but you will see the beautiful park um, when I speak uh, very briefly at the end again. So we've had those two readings from scripture. And of course, one of those, the reading from Luke, is the reading where Jesus gives his disciples the Lord's Prayer. Prayer is always important to us. It's a key part of our lives as Christians. And unsurprisingly, scripture has a lot to say about it. It might have a lot to say about it, but some of it, some of what it has to say is quite confusing. Some of it seems to contradict other parts. Perhaps prayer is becoming a new lifeline for us, in fact, at this time of uncertainty, when we're unable to meet and pray together in person. I know for myself that I'm making more structured time each day to pray using apps or books, and I tried to do that really intentionally at the beginning of lockdown, knowing that I couldn't be with my church family on a Sunday. Despite its importance and the fact that it's a theme scripture returns to again and again, and it's something we return to again and again as Christians, prayer is something that we find complicated and confusing, and sometimes we find very disappointing. As I found myself praying more and more, I find myself scrolling through social media in particular, and see the accounts of people whose relatives are sick, who are grieving and mourning, and who often want miracles. The trouble is, I don't believe that God is a Santa Claus in the sky figure who grants or doesn't grant our wishes on a whim. And I worry that as I pray for those people, most of whom I don't know and I just see appear on my Twitter feed or my Facebook feed, I'm worried that my prayers don't reflect my theology. In the midst of all this, we also know that there's a real need for prayer in our communities at the moment. Research says that one in four Britons have listened to a religious service since lockdown. and We know that that's a huge increase on the usual numbers that attend our churches on a Sunday. So there's this great call on us as people of faith to respond to this need for prayer, this need that I'm seeing perhaps when I scroll through my social media. But we do need to think about how we respond make sure that we're responding with integrity, saying something meaningful and profound about what we believe prayer is, rather than with false or cheap promises. And that's not just a call for our leaders or our spokespeople, but for all of us, because we are all being asked by family or friends or by strangers on the internet to pray. And we are a priesthood of all believers, so we all need a response to this great need in our community. In thinking about that, what that response might look like, which is something I've been doing, it seems sensible to go back to scripture and back, in a way, to basics, to what Jesus teaches us about prayer. Now, that reading from Luke is probably familiar to many of us, and quite possibly to lots of us who haven't been to church since school, but remember reciting the words of the Lord's Prayer as a child. And indeed, oftentimes, dementia patients uh, find, um, relatives of dementia patients rather find that it is the only thing that their loved ones can remember. So ingrained is it in those people having repeated it maybe over many years. Something that's very familiar to us, not just in the church, but in our community and our culture. The passage starts with the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray. And perhaps that's really the same question we're asking at this time. Show us how to pray. So Jesus does so and the prayer Jesus teaches starts with a proclamation of God's holiness. Father hallowed be your name. A prayer that starts with a reminder of who or what God is. God is holy, not vindictive, capricious or mercurial, but loving, merciful and gracious, the creator and sustainer of human dignity. Now, prayer doesn't remind God of anything. God doesn't need reminding, but we do. And when we say these words, it helps us to remember in a holy space before God that God is holy. We want to honour God's holiness in what we are and what we do, and we want to glorify God's name. 
and it is a reassurance to us before we come to God in prayer that we are praying to a God who is loving and who is kind. Often we know that the words we speak in prayer act as a reminder to us, much more so than they act as a reminder to God. Then Jesus moves on to those next words, your kingdom come. This reminds us of the focus of our prayers, the focus of all our prayers that should be ushering in the world as God wants the world to be. A world where human beings are valued and loved and know themselves valued and loved. Where people aren't hungry, cold, thirsty or alone, but safe. Our words of prayer proclaim the kingdom to us as God's people, striving to build God's world. And as we say those words, we are committing ourselves to building that world. It's interesting to ask ourselves when we pray, and to consider where, whether our prayers are prayers that seek to build up God's kingdom. Are they prayers that accord with those values? So Jesus teaches us to begin our prayers in that way, with reminders of who God is, and a commitment of ourselves in the presence of God to God's kingdom. I think the next line is perhaps the most radical and controversial. Give us this day our daily bread. Not give us more, Give us extravagance, give us prosperity, give us wealth. Make us powerful, but give us enough. Enough for today. This is a huge challenge to the culture we find ourselves in, and the culture Jesus would have found himself in, where we glorify the acquisition of more stuff. Jeff Bezos, who is the owner of Amazon and is now uh, on um, target to become the world's first trillionaire, has a net worth that equates to making $2,489 a second. More money than anyone can meaningfully earn or spend. And yet we find him held up as the epitome of success in our society. Are we brave enough, as we say these words of the prayer, to step outside of that narrative and of that social and cultural yearning and be content with just having enough? And of course, the flip side of that is, do we live in such a way that answers that prayer, that means everyone can have enough, rather than some having more than they can possibly use, and others having far less than they need? Because at their very core and foundation, the words we speak in prayer should be an expression of the way we want to live. A reminder to ourselves and a commitment in the presence of God. To how we should live our lives. Now these particular words in this commitment are particularly important at the moment when our government and our societies in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis are having taxing and difficult conversations about ensuring that everyone has enough. And there are lots of difficult issues, homelessness, domestic abuse, ongoing poverty, austerity, the use of food banks, but all feed into them. And actually those issues have had to come to the surface because we're having to discuss them openly to deal with the crisis we're finding ourselves in. And we're faced with the reality that there are many, many people in our society who do not have enough. Are we saying this prayer as a commitment to working towards a kingdom where everybody has their daily bread? The next lines are hard. And we often speak them casually and without proper regard. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Now, I was reading that from the NRSV, and I think it's interesting how those lines are rendered in that translation. We often say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And that's what our liturgy says. But this translation has a slightly different, more confrontational flavour almost as if we're reminding God that we have been forgiving, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, so God had better forgive us in turn. It's food for thought and a couple of PhD theses at least. Whichever way, we are praying there for a culture of forgiveness, where people are given second chances in the community and no one is beyond redemption. And again, this is a countercultural idea in a world which is so good at casting people aside. Whether they're cast aside because they're no use to our economic growth, they can't contribute, we think, 
to our society or whether we consider what they've done to be so wrong that we can't forgive them, as these verses uh, attest to. And of course, these verses don't mean that those who have been abused or mistreated should return it to the abusers or those that hurt them. You know, scripture is uh, consistent in its message that God is close to the brokenhearted, seeks to protect the hurting and the suffering. And forgiveness in those individual cases can take a lifetime and don't, in fact, rarely mean reconciliation. Here we're praying for a community that has space for everyone, that a community that gives second chances and doesn't dismiss people. And this is why I think that the Lord's Prayer is actually a very radical uh, document, a radical statement. It sets out that its manifesto is to work for the kingdom of God. And then it makes these two statements that are a real challenge to our culture. A culture that says we, want, we should want more, we should want to have more than others, we should accumulate wealth. And a culture that says that sometimes people are not useful and can be cast away. And instead of that, the Lord's Prayer offers a vision of a kingdom where people are forgiven, where people are offered second chances within the community, where people are never cast aside, and where everybody should have enough rather than living in inequality. If you've been watching the Bible studies this week on our channel, you'll know that on Monday I spoke about the book of Amos. And that's Amos's primary concern, the inequality of wealth, that there are wealthy people who live off the suffering and labour of the poor. They haven't committed to this idea that everybody should have enough. Jesus finishes the prayer with, and do not bring us to the time of trial, which is sometimes translated as do not lead us into temptation, a plea that we would remain holy and following in God's ways. In our liturgy, we then finish with a reassertion of God's kingdom as our goal, for thine is the kingdom. This whole prayer is about the creation of a different world. And by praying it, we commit ourselves to being part of that world and ask God to give us the strength to build it. Now, when I've been praying recently, I'm so challenged by thinking about the Lord's Prayer in this way, because the Lord's Prayer doesn't teach us to come before God with a list of requests. And that links us to a common misinterpretation of the next part of the passage, when it says, Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now this idea about God knowing what we want and not giving us something we haven't asked for has often been used to prop up this idea that God does just grant wishes, that we must ask God for things and that God will give them to us. But actually that passage ends with how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask them. This prayer isn't about asking for stuff, but about asking for the Holy Spirit to be in us, to be amongst us, to be amongst us in the community and amongst us and within our hearts. This is about growing in holiness and becoming closer to God and to God's will. The gift of the Holy Spirit, which equips us to work for God's kingdom, not the gift of more stuff. However much we may yearn for those things and however much those things are a precious and good thing to want. And I don't want to condemn us for asking God for those things that are close to our hearts, for the healing of people that we love. Those aren't flippant, those aren't the same as praying for a new sports car. But we are challenged here to know that God is sending us the Holy Spirit, which gives us peace, which gives us grace and compassion. That this verse is about something more profound, deeper perhaps, than we have been led to believe. There isn't much time to think in detail about the passage from James, but I do hope that its inclusion reminds us all that our lives, um, sorry, I do hope that its inclusion reminds us all that our lives of prayer must be connected to our lives of action. So just as we are praying for these things of the kingdom and for the Holy Spirit to come to us and bring us the things of God, just as we commit ourselves to the building of God's kingdom, we are called to work for these things. It is hard to know how to pray in these times, and we're surrounded by people whose prayers have been disappointed, even when they have asked for the things that their heart deeply desires. But in a world where we are being asked to respond as people of faith to this situation, perhaps we can offer to pray for and with people that the Holy Spirit would be with them, 
comforting them, walking alongside them in compassion, grace and peace, that they would know that Holy Spirit with them. Can we ensure our words of prayer aren't empty then by working and participating in God to bring that kindness, service and action of God's kingdom and of the Holy Spirit to those who are suffering? And perhaps very simply, when we struggle to find words to pray in the face of lockdown, we can return to those words from the Lord's Prayer, knowing that in seeking the things of God's kingdom, in seeking the Holy Spirit, we will find them. We'll have a short time of reflection now, and we're going to see some images and hear the words of the Teze chant, the Kingdom of God is Justice and Peace. Do feel free to just listen or to sing if you wish. Perhaps we might like to pray the words of the Lord's Prayer again in our minds or, or out loud and bring the other things that we wish to bring to God to him and to commit afresh to God to work for his kingdom and to ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. After that, Jeff will lead us in our prayers of intercession as we commit the world and all of our brothers and sisters to God's care. The kingdom of God is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, and open in us the gates of your kingdom. The kingdom of God is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, and open in us the gates of your kingdom. The kingdom of God is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, First, a prayer for ourselves. Dear Lord, sometimes I do not appreciate what I have until it is taken away from me. I miss the hug of a family member, that hug that says more than words ever can. The hug that tells me I'm loved without condition that I am loved for being me, the hug that tells me all will be okay. I miss the sharing of time with friends, the spontaneous laughter, the gentle teasing, the beauty of the sharing of a meal. I miss being able to worship in a church, the singing of hymns with others, the passing of the peace, the sound of children in the Sunday school, the shared fellowship. 
So many things I miss. Help me, Lord, to use this time wisely, that I may realise and be grateful for the many people that I have often taken for granted. I realise more and more the many joys that you have given and continue to give to me. When things begin to get back to some kind of normality, as they surely will, may I be more aware of these moments of joy and truly value them. Also, that I may live more in the present moment, giving my full attention to the people who mean so much to me. For I know that this is the way of true love. Amen. And now our prayers of intercession. Dear Lord, we bring before you our concerns for the world. There are so many situations that need our prayers and sometimes our hearts are overflowing and we hardly know where to begin. And yet we know that you know our prayers even before we utter them. So we offer these prayers in hope, love and confidence. Where there is war, wherever it may be, we pray for peace with justice. We pray that those in conflict may listen to each other, may respect and honour each other. Where there is sickness, we pray for health. We particularly at this time pray for those throughout the world suffering from the coronavirus. We particularly think of those who are unable to get the care and attention they need and deserve. We pray for those in despair, for those who have lost a loved one, for those who feel stressed or have mental health problems, that they may find hope and peace in you. We pray and give thanks for all those involved in health care, the work of doctors and nurses, psychologists and psychiatrists, care workers, ambulance men and women, and so many more who are giving so much to help others. We hold in love those we know who need our prayers. May they cast their anxiety on you. We pray for the circuit. We particularly pray for Geoffrey on adoption leave and his partner Steve and little Johnny. We also pray for Adam, Cathy and Claudia as they seek to reach out in new ways of ministry as our church doors remain closed. We know, Lord, our prayers are inadequate, but they are heartfelt. We pray that your will be done and that we may be your instruments living out our lives of love and service through the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again for being with us this morning. I hope that that was fruitful and helpful for you at this time. Know that you are all in our prayers and we hope you are able to stay safe and healthy until we're able to meet again in person. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, be with us today and this week we pray. Send your spirit to be in the midst of us that we might herald the coming of your kingdom, of peace, of joy and of forgiveness. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with us all, now and evermore. Amen.